get my six. But before I do either, drink this coffee and then potentially go find Bigfoot Sasquatch, I'm going to tell you guys a story. <clears throat> but before that, I want to wish my big sister Carrie a happy birthday today. It's her birthday. She's uh, 13 months older than me. We were almost Irish twins, missed it by two months. Um, I texted her first thing this morning around 11 a.m. when I remembered it was her birthday. Uh, after remembering it was Brett Favre's birthday because I used to collect football cards and I remember looking at the back of one of his cards it said his he was born October 10. I thought, huh, that's neat. Same birthday as my sister. So I was singing Brett Favre's birthday today. Somebody else's. Who who? By, so by 11, I remembered. So I texted her and I said, happy birthday, old woman. And she texted me back and she said, thank you, slightly less old man or slightly less old or whatever. Um, she, she has a hard time with the getting older thing, and we've talked about it. Uh, I don't. I'm grateful. Every time I have a birthday and I got one coming up next month, I'm like, wow, I'm still here. And I'm grateful. And she's grateful, too. She's a good person. Uh, anyway, happy birthday, Carrie. Now, let's get on with the story. Okay. Notice how it just got quiet. There were some squirrels and birds in here. Keep watching, okay? So, you know, last October, I would come out and every night of the month, I read a story from October Nights. A lot of you folks remember that. October Nights Part 2 is very much under, well, under works right now, but it's going to be next year before it's finished. Uh, but I enjoyed that myself, and so I wanted to sit up here this evening and read you a creepy story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the first story from Bigfoot Sasquatch Files Volume 11, the new one that just came out about a week ago. It's on Amazon. It's not in our Etsy store. It's available in print and Kindle on Amazon, and the link is in the description box below. When I was writing that, I made sure to make... I made sure to make several of the stories a YouTube platform appropriate. Uh, there's no adult situations, I don't think. Um, no foul language. If I come across any in this story, I'll fix it on the fly. Uh, but for the thousands upon thousands of you who have been following the Bigfoot Sasquatch Files saga, you're going to notice at one point in the story, and I, I hate to be a spoiler, but you're going to be like, that sounds familiar. Uh, if you'll remember, I believe it was Bigfoot Sasquatch Files Volume 2. Uh, there was a story called She Got Too Close. It was originally titled The Unfortunate Demise of uh, Hori Tori is what it was called. I mean, that's just... Uh, and, and if you read that story, you understand why she was called that. This is a story that actually part of the story towards the end takes place on the same night. So just remember what happened to Hori Tori. And she was a privileged, you know, trust baby type. Uh, who just was all about herself. And uh, you'll remember she ran over and killed a baby Bigfoot Sasquatch on her way home from the brewery with Travis, her little you know, boy toy she was taking home from the brewery. Um, we know how that story ended. She did meet her unfortunate demise. So just keep that in mind. This story is called Careful What You Eat. It was originally titled The Unfortunate Demise of Mr. Ghoul. All these stories, this is a Bigfoot Sasquatch Halloween special, Volume 11 was, because it's October. Uh, why do my, some of my stories have two titles? Because they're worthy of having two titles. Some stories are just that good. You know, so you, you, know, you make it one title, and you man, this story needs another one. So this is one of those two titled stories. And with no further ado, as my beautiful bride dearly would say, I'll get into it. <clears throat> The group of mourners, silent as they stood in a small country cemetery, no doubt had been had to be thinking the same thing and would have said it aloud if the moment were appropriate. No child should die so young, 
No child should die so young, the officiating pastor said for them as if he'd read the group's mind. But it is not of us to ask why, he continued, for no man shall question our loving God. We must merely accept that it was all part of his plan for a greater cause. More than just a few of the mourners were distracted by the beautiful array of colorful leaves on the trees of the Blue Ridge Mountains that surrounded them. The scenery was, was a nice distraction, if only momentarily, from the sad cause for which all were gathered today. One mourner elbowed lightly the mourner beside them and gave a head nod to what appeared to be a man standing just inside the tree line on top of a hill where field met forest above them, about 100 yards away. Is that Mr. Ghoul? Mr. A asked, or mourner A asked mourner B. Mourner B turned and looked behind her. No, she said, he's back there at his house. Mourner A turned and sure enough, he too saw Mr. Ghoul, creepy old man that everyone thought he was, about a quarter of a mile away, watching the services from the raised deck of his centuries-old farmhouse through a pair of binoculars. His property adjoined that of the cemetery and the church which owned it. Mr. Gould had nothing to do with the church, and the church and its people had nothing to do with him. Then who is that? Mourner A asked Mourner B as they both turned back around. They looked back into the woods, but the figure they believed they'd seen earlier was no longer there. Must have been a shadow, Mourner B said, or a tree. I guess so, Mourner A said in agreement, and then they both continued listening to the pastor talk about how our kind God allows children to die in order to serve a greater cause. Mr. Gould was as much of a curiosity these days as he'd been a generation before, watching every funeral service of the cemetery beside his house from afar. Little did many people alive today know, but a generation before Mr. Gould had been as much of a curiosity at similar affairs held several counties over, just as he had been a curious observer from a distance of the same type of affairs a state or two north a generation before that. In a word, Mr. Gould was old, very old, and he needed to eat to stay alive. Mr. Gould, having been found out, had hopped on a ship as a stowaway in Germany back in 1677. He had safely sailed undiscovered across the Atlantic, and then he took up with a large group of settlers in Pennsylvania. Many of his kind had done the same in the, in the 1670s, uh, but most of his kind stayed back in Germany, able to evade capture and killing for at least nearly another century, when the remainder of them would sail to the New World and settle in the Louisiana and Mississippi area. Mr. Gould, even while living in Germany for centuries, had gotten really good at going undetected. It was only because of a couple of drunken cemetery workers, grave diggers he'd never noticed on the night of the incident of his discovery, who'd run their mouths about what they'd seen him doing that had gotten him in trouble. Since then, for nearly four centuries, he'd made sure to have no more slip-ups. Only once during that time, while in America, and while acting upon his baser needs, was he observed by a witness. But that witness didn't make it out of the cemetery the night of said observation. Mr. Gould had made sure of that. <clears throat> Mr. Gould's belly had been quite full from the corpse he'd consumed by the time he realized he was being observed, so he couldn't eat the entire observer after having chased the observer down, the observer being a man of about 20. So he ate what he could, both arms and much of the torso, and then he fled to Virginia in order to avoid any questioning. Ah, Mr. Gould said to himself as he witnessed the current funeral from the safety of his home, Perfect. A small casket might mean a small meal, but it also means a body that should have had much longer to live, which equals a greater extension for me. I think that lunatic Blair Witch Squirrel's back throwing nuts at me back here. That's a bird, though. That's a Carolina Wren. Carolina Wren can't throw nuts. All right, <clears throat> keep watching. Keep getting my six. At this point, many curious readers, or listeners in this case, might find themselves asking, what is it with this extension business? In a word, Mr. Gould, who would be known as a Rougarou had he settled in the Louisiana regions with many of his fellows, needed to consume the flesh of the dead in order to extend his life. The younger the body of the dead consumed, the longer the extension of Mr. Gould's life. Life extension had been easier hundreds of years ago. Uh, illness, lack of medical advancements, and sheer hard physical work made people die of old age in their mid to late 40s. 
Nowadays, with half the people in America spending half of their lifetime over 40, Mr. Gould found himself needing to take on more and more extensions. It was always easy when generations were dying off in mass. Sure, the extensions weren't long, but there were just so many of them. However, this was not one such time. This was the lag period between the huge dying off periods of the World War II generation and their baby boomer children. These damn baby boomers, Mr. Gould found himself saying over and over, why do they have to be so damn health conscious and live for so damn long? The service that Mr. Gould had observed from the safety of his centuries-old farmhouse finally came to an end. The mourners left in small groups, sporadically, yet eventually entirely. And the sun would set and darkness would fall, and Mr. Gould would slowly stalk his way into the cemetery, and he would have his meal. <clears throat> On this particular night, as Mr. Gould enjoyed his feast of young flesh by the light of a full moon just after midnight, he found himself entertaining an idea he'd entertained off and on through the dry spells of generational die-offs. I wonder what one might taste like, he said aloud. The one he was wondering about was another oddity of our world, one few people have seen, and one that most people would never believe existed, just as they would never believe that creatures such as Mr. Ghoul himself existed. Bigfoot Sasquatch. They live easily four times longer than these human creatures, Mr. Ghoul said, in between bites of an appetizer-sized forearm. Oh, the extension I could get from that, especially if they were young. Excuse me. <clears throat> Mr. Gould finished his meal, feeling the precious years being added to his existence. When he was full, he reburied the now empty casket, just as it had been buried when he'd entered the cemetery only a couple of hours before, and then he went home. When he got home, he slept more soundly than he'd slept since he'd last dined a year and a half before. Over the next couple of years, Mr. Gould, while still feeling quite youthful from his last feast, continued to entertain the idea of eating the corpse of a Bigfoot Sasquatch. But questions such as, where would he find one, and do they even bury their dead, continued to weigh on his mind. It's decided, Mr. Gould said, aloud, and with a tiny hint of his German accent still noticeable to anyone with a keen ear for such things. Should I ever see a dead one, and the others are not around, I will eat of its flesh. Then, after thinking of the odds of finding a dead Bigfoot Sasquatch, a feat even so many of his human counterparts have never, never been able to achieve, like this guy, still looking, he laughed loudly, throwing his head back as he did. He continued laughing almost to the point of maniacal laughter until his attention was distracted by the sound of screeching tires, a loud thump, and the end result being a dead Bigfoot Sasquatch. Remember, she got too close. Remember that story. The unfortunate demise of Hori Tori. Holy, got that one. Mr. Ghoul, a man, uh, well, a Rougarou, who rarely cursed, said, I guess I was wrong on the odds. Why, tomorrow morning, I may just go out and buy a lottery ticket. The car that had hit the creature in the road a hundred yards away from Mr. Gould's house had kept going after having hit it. Mr. Gould, as he made his way to the body of the victim, assumed that the driver either believed they'd hit a bear or perhaps had gotten a good look at what they'd hit just before the moment of impact and were scared that they'd run over a human being and were driving off to avoid prosecution. Mr. Gould believed he'd gotten a good look at the car despite the distance and the darkness because the incident happened within the light of one of the few artificial lights out this way an actual street light. The car appeared to be a BMW that he knew to be driven by a woman who lived up the road known as Hori Tori because her name was Tori and she was a whore. Just before Mr. Gould reached the body of the creature, he stopped and he hid behind a large tree because he could see that there were two large dark objects moving out of the woods and toward the figure lying dead at the side of the road. Once these two figures reached their objective, and once they realized their partner was dead, they let out loud, mournful wails. <clears throat> one of the creatures picked up the dead one and held it close to its breast. This is when Mr. Gould made the connection. This creature, this Bigfoot Sasquatch that had just been hit and killed by Hori Tori from down the road, was the child of the other two. This was a family, and though Mr. Gould had no sense of real emotions, he knew that he should feel bad at this time, and he thought to himself that he would if he could.
After a couple of moments of holding their dead child, the two, much larger than the deceased Bigfoot Sasquatch, Sasquatches, made low, angry-sounding guttural growls. They lay their child back on the ground, and then they started walking up the road in the direction that the car that had killed their child had gone. If I didn't know any better, Mr. Gould said to himself, softly, after making sure the two larger Bigfoot Sasquatches had made the turn of the bend in the road, I would say they're going after that dirty little whore. Mr. Gould's thoughts left those of BMW driving Hori Tori and returned to the feast before him. He assumed that since the creatures had left the corpse and their child lying where he'd, they'd found it, that these Bigfoot Sasquatch creatures indeed did not bury their dead. Oh well, Mr. Gould said, bending over the body and taking up a leg. No need to let good food go to waste. Mr. Gould feasted like a god. He was happy that the flesh resembled that of humans so much that there was little difference in the taste at all. He could feel his life extending as he ate, and he reveled at the thought that he was not only taking in a much longer life extension, but that the meal was as large as an adult human, even though this Bigfoot Sasquatch had still been quite young at its moment of death. Once, while Mr. Gould ate, he paused and hid, fearing at first that the parents of the newly deceased Bigfoot Sasquatch were coming back. However, he watched, as for some odd reason, a man, appearing to be in his early 20s, was walking down the road, headed in the opposite direction from which the Bigfoot Sasquatches had gone on the hunt of the woman who had killed their child. If you read Volume 2, we know that this is Travis. He performed his services, and he got his money, and he was now walking back, throwing up in his mouth, thinking about what he had just done, but walking back to, well... Some of you haven't read it yet. I don't want to ruin it for you. Okay. Mr. Gould watched as the young man stopped once, pulled a wad of cash out of his pocket, counted it, put it back in his pocket, and then threw up a little bit in his mouth and then spit it out and then kept on walking. What in the hell was that all about? Mr. Gould said, speaking to himself in the dark. Mr. Gould obviously didn't read Bigfoot Sasquatch Files Volume 2. <laughs> Should he even have been in Volume 11? Well, whatever. Okay. Then, only moments later, and after he'd begun dining again on his meal, he stopped. As he could, he could have sworn he'd heard what sounded like a woman screaming, as if she was being ripped to shreds by a couple of Bigfoot Sasquatches. Well, I guess they found her, Mr. Gould said, aloud, and then he went back to eating. As delicious as his meal was, and as lengthy as the extension it gave him was, Mr. Gould found that he could not eat the entire corpse. So he stopped, leaving the feet, one hand, and most of the face still attached to the skull. He very slowly lumbered back up the hill to his centuries-old farmhouse where he planned to sleep the sleep of the dead, since he'd just eaten the dead, for at least two days. But his plans failed. Oh, his plans of getting home and sleeping like the dead worked out for him. However, after only one hour of sleeping like the dead, he became the dead himself. After mother and father Bigfoot Sasquatch had found that privileged white B-word hori tori and summarily ripped her head off of her body, they had returned to the corpse of their child with the intentions of carrying it off to their super-secret Bigfoot Sasquatch burial ground, conveniently hidden, by the way, of brambles, brush, and briars, right in the middle of a network of heavily hiked trails, and giving it a proper burial, only to find that the majority of the corpse had been eaten. That burial site, by the way, I think is from Volume 1. can't remember. Mother and father Bigfoot Sasquatch wasted no time in taking up the scent trail of what had eaten their baby. They were not surprised to find that the trail led to Mr. Gould's centuries-old farmhouse. They'd had their eyes on him for some time, knowing who he was and, more importantly, what he was, and always wondering if one of their kind might make it to his dinner table someday. Sadly, for them, today was that day, and very unfortunately for him, today was that day. Mr. Gould awakened to the feeling even though he'd been asleep, of being watched. He opened his eyes and saw two ginormous creatures standing at the foot of his bed. As they began coming toward him, one of them coming around each side of the bed, both with their arms outstretched, Mr. Gould yelled, Oh, shit! The end. Time to go find him, her, it, or they. See you for more next time.